to Martina Totsaurova because it, it is really easy for me to remember this Velvet Revolution anniversary as we got married in Prague in the old town hall in Staromieskie Namiesti next to the Horloi, which is a Czech clock, 30 years ago, just a few months before Velvet became a word associated with revolution. <laughs> So Bohemia is my second home, and this event's first idea came from Martina. Uh, so for that, I would like to thank her again. In 1989, I was a FAMU film student, FAMU being the Czech film school, doing an apprenticeship at the legendary Czech animation studios Bracip Triku in Barandov, where I produced my first professional animated film. My visa was revoked after my marriage and was asked to leave the country in October. My farewell party was at a Pivnice, which is a beer pub, near the West Germany embassy. On that night, when we came out of the pub, finally, I saw an iconic vision of the new times that were to unfold. The street was packed with Trabants, the automobiles that the East Germans fabricated at the time. That was the night where dozens or hundreds of East Germans jumped the fence to the land in the garden of the West Germany embassy. They left everything behind, including their cars. I have decided that my mandate as a director of ACTI at LMU would be to explore the liminal qualities of borders and frontiers, rites of passages that occur in history, transitional periods that makes us, mo makes us vulnerable but redefine our strengths, either for an individual or for a whole country. An immigrant also crosses boundaries into the unknown. The Velvet Revolution created, in some way, a collective state of mind to transition into the open, which was to all unknown. The Velvet Revolution was a liminal period, a unique collective rite of passage, which became an inspiration for many of us. Um, Please uh, help me welcome Roberta Espinosa, who has a word for us. She's the Vice Provost for Global Local Initiatives at Loyola Marymount University. Roberta. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Jose, uh, for that generous introduction um, and for your strong leadership of the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, ACDI, um, the acronym, um, for organizing this very important event. Um, it is inspiring to see such a robust uh, attendance this evening, so thank you all for being here. On behalf of the administration here at Loyola Marymount University, um, I want to warmly welcome our faculty, staff, students, and importantly, our esteemed special guests who will serve on our panel this evening, who will be sharing with us their personal experiences um, about their role and their uh, significant role, I would add, um, in the Velvet Revolution. The timing of this event uh, is quite fitting um, because it is International Education Week across the country um, and Global Citizen Day specifically here at LMU. Um, unfortunately, the rain and the weather uh, challenged us this afternoon, um, so we did have to cancel a few events, um, but we will no doubt uh, reignite uh, Global Citizen Day here at LMU uh, in the future um, and definitely in the spring. At LMU, we take uh, this week to celebrate the numerous benefits of international exchange um, and uh, international education and worldwide exchange. My role here at LMU as the Vice Provost for Global Local Initiatives and the university's inaugural senior international officer is precisely to do some of what we will see tonight, uh, to facilitate collaborations and professional relationships among LMU faculty, staff, alumni, and other institutions um, in our greater Los Angeles area and beyond related to comprehensive internationalization and local community engagement. With that very small charge, um, <laughs> and I say that a little sarcastically, um, but it is a charge that I am deeply committed to, um, I'm really honored to be in this position to support events like this through the co-sponsorship that provides our community at large 
with an opportunity where they can learn about key historical events to better understand the dynamics that exist today and how they came to be. And what a unique and special experience tonight to learn about this, the significance of this specific time period through the testimonials of those who played a part in it. Um, this is precisely why providing our students and our community, um, ourselves included in that, um, is so important to have entryways into global learning experiences at home and abroad, and that being so critical to their learning experiences um, in college and beyond. Um, in that endeavor, we try to prepare students to live, lead, and collaborate in an international and interconnected world, and to cultivate the skills, knowledge, and attitudes that are tied to building global awareness and intercultural competencies. I think that this event fits well all within um, that arena. Um, I think our president would agree that events like this tonight provide our community with ideal opportunities to engage with and broaden what he refers to as our global imaginations. So I hope that we will all take that challenge on this evening. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Help me welcome His Excellency Pavel Shepelak, uh, Consul General of the Czech Republic in Los Angeles. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, distinguished guests, uh, dear friends, uh, allow me also on behalf of Czech Consulate General uh, to welcome you and uh, to thank wholeheartedly uh, Loyola Marymount University for partnering with us in preparation of this event. Yes, special event goes to distinguished Jose Garcia Moreno, uh, his assistant Emilu, and all wonderful team of LMU. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I know you like speeches. Uh, the time is short. We should have started at 6. We started 6.18. So anyhow, uh, I know there will be a panel discussion. Allow me just small remarks before this panel discussion. Uh, it is true we wouldn't have our November 1989 Velvet Revolution as it was called first time by Western journalists, without geopolitical effects from that time, former Soviet leader Gorbachev Perestroika, and dramatic developments in other communist bloc country, especially the fall of Berlin Wall, which gave also to us, Czechs and Slovak, the hope for the changes. 30 years ago, we made it. We overthrown the communist regime. We returned among Western democracies. And today, we are part of important integration groupings, both European and transatlantic, EU and NATO. And I am very pleased that today we can welcome uh, with us the delegation composed of distinguished members from both Czech Republic and Los Angeles. And who they are, allow me to introduce them. I am just hesitant whether I have to read it. Do I have still the time? There is one advantage. All of you, you have leaflets. So there are short CV of our participants. So, Jose, I am now looking at you. You are the boss. We are in your premises. Uh, do I have to shortly introdu introduce all of them? Uh, maybe it would be nice. And I will start with the ladies. If uh, I'm old European gentleman, I know gender issue is sensitive here, especially in Hollywood. But allow me to start with ladies. And I will start with Pavlina, as I call her, Pavlinka. Moskalikova. Pavlina graduated from Prague Film School 
that produce such a world-known director as Miloš Forman, Ivan Passer, and others. She worked on Czech television, films, and specials, directed popular character dramedy. But her directing career was interrupted when she was blacklisted for signing petition urging that co time communist government of Czechoslovakia to resign and to free Václav Havel, head of dissident movement in Czechoslovakia, from prison. Presently, Pavlina lives and works in Los Angeles. She was European Union of Arts awarded Pavlina for her artistic and cultural activities, the Golden European Award, and Czechoslovak Society for Science and Art awarded Pavlina with Special Centennial Award last year. Pavlinka, can you stand up? So this is Pavlinka. <laughs> Second lady, Tatiana Gregor Brzobohata, is Miss World 2006, her top model, <laughs> philanthropist, founder and chairwoman of the board of directors of Beauty of Health Foundation. She is an internationally known personality and the only Miss World who has engaged for more than 10 years in supporting the other, the older people and raising awareness about aging of population and demographic challenges. She is member of the Council of Prominent Women Leaders. Since 2014, she is part of Forbes 30 under 30. Currently, she has become ambassador of the UN for sustainable development, if I am like goals, yeah, SDGs, if this is right. That's it, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you saved me. Uh, as you know, uh, our revolution was triggered by students, and I am very pleased to have with us two prominent leaders of the student movement of Czech, Czechoslovak Velvet Revolution. The first one, Václav Bartuška. Was his, for his active fight against totalitarian communist regime in that time, Czechoslovakia, first detained by secret police at age of 20. At the age of 22, due to his previous experience, was elected by parliament of the, uh, to the commission investigating secret police. In 1990, published his first book called Polo Jasno. Pa translation would be partly sunny or partly cloudy, as you like, partly sunny. Mr. Bartuška prefer partly sunny, which cover his work or on investigating the secret police. Uh, book was very successful, uh, sold 230,000 copies, and as he himself said, uh, disbandoning the secret police shortly after the revolution was the best job I ever had. Since 2006, Václav Bartuška assumes position of ambassador at large at the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs for energy security. He is also teaching <laughs> at New York University Prague campus and Czech Technical University of Prague. Václav Bartuška. The next leader of student movement, Jan Bubenik, who after revolution served as the youngest member uh, of the first federal parliament. 
He has also been active with human rights and pro-democracy NGOs, helping in Bulgaria, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Cuba, where he was arrested and jailed by Castro's regime in 2001. He is the founder of and managing partner of Bubenik Partners and has spent the past 20 years placing expatriates as well as local C-level executives into top position in companies in the Czech Republic and internationally. Jan Bubenik. Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, James Ragan. He's an internationally recognized American poet, playwright, screenwriter, and essayist with Czechoslovak roots, who is distinguished for his role as a cultural ambassador with reading for seven heads of state, maybe it's grown the number in the meantime, and audiences in 34 nations. He has also read at the United Nations twice in Carnegie Hall, and in 1985, he was invited together with Bob Dylan to perform for Mikhail Gorbachev at the first International Poetry Festival in Moscow, in front of the audience of more than 10,000. Czech President Václav Havel has called him an ambassador of art, translated into 15 languages. He has authored nine books of poetry, and he also was honored with a lot of tributes and awards. James Ragan. And now allow me uh, to invite to the podium another important member of the Czech delegation coming from Prague, new special envoy for expatriate abroad, my colleague, Jiří Krátky. In Mr. Moreno. Madame Espinoza, dear Professor Drummond, distinguished professors, dear guests, and members of the Czech expatriate community in California. 30 years ago, my country lived a very exceptional moment, moment of a strategic and important change that influenced life of all of us. It was like a reading the book that has the first part and the second part. The division of our possibilities between that half that was before 89 and the second one that was after was so dramatic that only someone who really witnessed this can be kind of testimony of everything what happened. And for this reason, I thought that maybe the 30 years anniversary of the Velvet Revolution would be the best idea how to make kind of communication bridge between the year 89 and 2019. 30 years, like a period that is a difference that makes the life of the whole generation. How what actually happened, how what happened in 89 was seen by the people who were constructed and who were building the new revolution, the new presence, and how it is seen by the generation of today. It's a very interesting moment where we can compare. And I think it would be very interesting as well for you to share this experience. I think that all of the guests that you have here will be the best testimonies, will give you the best testimonies of what they lived and how they perceived actually what they lived. And I would like to encourage you to ask them the personal questions because the ideas that were behind are very important. 
I say that behind all the meetings and all, all the events in the history, very important story were behind. And why we were so much struggling for freedom, for market economy, for democracy, and, and for the national sovereignty, it's a very important reason and the moment to ask even today. Because the history goes sometimes back and repeats the same mistakes that we did. And I would like actually that this discussion that we will have today will be kind of promotion of what we lived in the past, not only into the present, but mainly into the future. Uh, I would like to thank the University of uh, Marymount, Loyola, Marymount Loyola University of California for giving us this space, because I think that this event really merits. To start with kind of uh, introduction that really would involve you into the atmosphere of the year of the 1989, we prepared a short video uh, projection. It's about 10 minutes. And, how, and I hope that actually it will remind you the history of 30 years ago. And then we will start the discussion. Enjoy the evening and uh, please, we are on the academic field, so don't be afraid to ask the questions that maybe you never asked before. the theaters gave their performances 17th, 1989 November 17th, 1989 hundreds wounded one presumably dead the communist regime in Czechoslovakia was drawing to a close we all were looking admiringly to America and that was dream of most of young people what kind of freedom they had there and that was our wish, our dream we could achieve something like that. The encounter of external geopolitical factors and the rapid procession of events culminating in the Velvet Revolution left the ailing leadership of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia unable to respond to rising popular dissent and ultimately led to the end of communism in Czechoslovakia. After the Second World War, when Russian tanks came into Czechoslovakia, they were welcomed with cheers and gratefulness for liberating the country from the Nazis. The Communist Party took advantage of that feeling and gained a plurality of 38% in the first post-war elections and formed a coalition government with other left-wing parties. In February 1948, however, the Communist Party staged a coup d'etat and 40 years of totalitarian rule ensued. Czechoslovakia, along with the other Soviet satellite countries, was isolated from the West. An iron curtain has descended across the continent. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. In 1968, a new generation of the Czechoslovak Communist Party leaders, headed by liberal reformer Alexander Dubček, came to power and pressed for economic liberalization and relaxation of censorship in what became known as the Prague Spring. Freedom of speech and press emerged, and for the first time, political commentary was allowed in the media, even though Dubček's socialism with the human face policies were popular among the general public. Hardline communists, both in Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union, resisted the changes. To prevent an uprising, the USSR led several negotiations affirming Czechoslovakia's loyalty to the Warsaw Pact. When the reforms continued, the Soviet Union took a military alternative. In mid-August 1968, the USSR and other members of the Warsaw Pact mounted the largest military operation in Europe since the end of the Second World War. 200,000 troops and 5,000 tanks invaded Czechoslovakia with no opposition from the Czech army. Ordinary citizens resisted the invasion, however, painting over the street names and doing anything possible to stop the invaders. Dubček and the other communist reformists were replaced by hardline communists and an era of ubiquitous state power continued. 
Throughout the 1970s and 80s, dissidents challenged the government with independent thinking and by embracing Western influences like music and clothes in addition to democratic ideals. Charter 77 was the first organized opposition in Czechoslovakia to encounter the Communist Party, and in 1977 it published a manifesto, along with signatures, in Western newspapers proclaiming their opposition to the government because it didn't protect human rights. The document was banned and the signatories were persecuted. A decade later in the mid-80s, Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, had enacted his perestroika and glasnost reforms which sought to overcome Soviet economic stagnation and grant greater freedom. These reforms ultimately contributed to the eventual dissolution of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. With the USSR preoccupied with these reforms, and the Iron Curtain crumbling in Poland, Hungary, and Eastern Germany, tension in Czechoslovakia increased as the spirit of revolution encountered the unyielding communist government. But on the 17th of November, 1989, all of the circumstances aligned and set up the path towards change. Students of Prague universities organized a demonstration to commemorate a student being killed in an anti-Nazi protest 50 years earlier. The demonstration was permitted by the authorities because anti-Nazism was in line with the communist historical narrative. On the evening of November 17th, thousands of students marched without incident on the designated route, but as more and more people of all ages joined, the focus of the demonstration shifted to discontent with current politics, and an increasing number of people started holding up anti-government signs and shouting phrases against the leaders of the Communist Party. They peacefully walked with candles, singing songs about freedom and shouting slogans. But soon, the protesters encountered the police, who created a blockade from both sides, preventing them from continuing or leaving. The space between us uh, was getting to be smaller and smaller. I personally had a feeling, I cannot breathe. What, what, what should we do? And we, we cannot leave, we cannot escape. There was no escape. I, that was the time when the police uh, started to beat everyone. Everyone was shouting, crying. When we managed to escape, we, we saw some people laying on the ground and also there was lots of blood. It was really terrible. To students who attended the rally, and to citizens of Prague, this event seemed monumental because of the unprecedented police brutality. However, because of the state-controlled media, people in the majority of the country were at first skeptical or completely unaware of what had occurred. The following day, the student unions organized a strike for all the Prague universities, and later that day, all the theaters in Prague joined the students to create awareness of what had happened. None of the theaters gave their performances, and instead the audience took part in discussions, sharing their experiences and urging others to protest. Václav Havel, a playwright and dissident who had only been released from jail a few weeks prior, helped utilize the anger people felt because of the police brutality and long years of a controlling regime, and transfer it into something concrete and productive. He combined Charter 77 and other anti-government groups to form the Občanské Forum, or Civic Forum, which was composed of actors, students, dissidents, and ordinary people. The Civic Forum became the platform of opposition to the Communist Party, and eventually successfully negotiated a non-violent transition of power. There was a saying popularized by Havel about the length of revolutions in Europe. In Poland it took 10 years, in Hungary 10 months, in East Germany 10 weeks. Perhaps in Czechoslovakia it will take 10 days. Although the complete revolution in Czechoslovakia took longer than 10 days, the spirit of enthusiasm remained. Over the course of the weeks following the demonstration on the 17th, foreign news reporters broadcasted the Velvet Revolution to the entire world. However, in order to let the Czech public know what was happening, the students created pamphlets, leaflets, and posters. The term Velvet Revolution was most likely coined by Western journalists to symbolize a peaceful negotiated regime change. In Prague, there were daily protests, and communist leaders who encountered resistance among people tried desperately to maintain a semblance of order. The Czechoslovak Communist Party had observed the crumbling of communist regimes all over Europe, 
and without the support of the Soviet Union, there was great uncertainty of how to react to the rallying public. People congregated, talked about solutions, and most of all, didn't lose hope. At one of the rallies, Marta Kubishova, who had written a song opposing the invasion of tanks in 68, sang the same iconic song about freedom. The song became a staple to this revolution as well, and would be sung many times after. On November 24th, the top leaders of the Communist Party resigned. Without the support of the Soviet Union, and with other former communist countries declaring democracy, the Czechoslovak Communist Party experienced inner turmoil. Along with the inability to form a coherent party and the encounter of nationwide protest, the Communist Party was left with no option but to resign. Gradually, the terms proposed by the Civic Forum were accepted by the government. The political prisoners were released, the government was renewed, and the free elections were planned for the following June. All the people were dancing, they're shouting, be really, they are in tears that this really happened and we succeeded. The communists sensed their defeat, so in December, the parliament unanimously elected Václav Havel, the leader of the Civic Forum and arguably the entire Velvet Revolution, as the president. When the communist regime encountered overwhelming public protest and an uncertain geopolitical climate, it was unable to adapt and was left no choice but to peacefully transition power to the democratic protest movement. The Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, through nonviolent action and mass protest, became the model for other countries which attempted their own revolutions. It became a precedent and showed the true power of the people and what they can accomplish without resorting to violence. Current and future revolutions have the potential to take inspiration from the Velvet Revolution and create a peaceful exchange of power, providing hope for the future of our world. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Elizabeth Drummond, who's going to be moderating the panel tonight. Uh, just a few words about Elizabeth. She's an associate professor and chair of history in the history department here at Loyola Marymount University. She's also affiliated with uh, the European Studies, Women's Studies, and Jewish Studies program. She earned her PhD at Georgetown University with a specialty in modern Central European history. She has published a number of articles on the German-Polish national conflict in the late 19th and early 20th century, including one on the role of, Guma, of women in nationalist mobilization and the gendering of nationalism on the position of Jews in the German-Polish national conflict and on the imagery and symbols employed by German and Polish nationalists in the construction of nationalist identities. Thanks so much, Jose, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. I'm very appreciative of our guests who are going to spend the evening with us and share their knowledge and their experiences. Uh, this is really uh, the perfect timing for this event. We are exactly 30 years removed um, from the Velvet Revolution, as it came to be called. Uh, as an, and I'm, I'm fortunate because of the video, and I thank you for that. I don't have to do any of the real historical framing, although I suspect most people in this crowd already know that history. Um, but a, a revolution that began with student demonstrations on November 17th, uh, followed by the establishment of the Civic Forum, uh, a permanent strike. Uh, and what I was wondering if, just to get us started, uh, if our panelists might uh, kind of take us back 30 years. Um, and let us know what you were doing in those November days. And I'm actually going to start at the end with Tatiana, who was very young in November of 1989. Um, so maybe, Tatiana, if you could say maybe what some of your first memories of learning about the Velvet Revolution were. And then for the rest of you, if you could talk a little bit about what you were doing, where you were 30 years ago. Thank you. 
Thank you for this question. Okay, well, um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, this panel. Uh, it's a privilege and honor. Thank you so much. Well, so I was born in uh, 1987. So as you can imagine, I was just two years old and I was spending my uh, time, that time, uh, with my family. Uh, I was surrounded with my um, extended family because I'm pure Czechoslovak. My father is Slovak, my mom is Czech. And I was raised in the uh, east, eastern part of Bohemia, uh, in Hradec Králové, and later in Opočno. And yeah, I can remember my father was telling me, uh, he was a student at that time, he was 25 years old. So he was saying that it was just amazing. Uh, everybody was uh, going crazy, all the schools were closed. And um, yeah, I was staying with, with my mom, so I really don't remember a thing. <laughs> but um, I have to say that um, communist era was really tough on my family. My family was persecuted many, many years because my grandfather, he didn't sign up an uh, agreement in 1968. So um, my family survived by holding together. That was the way um, everybody survived at bad times. Um, and of course, Velvet Revolution, I, I would not be standing here and I would never uh, pursued my, my dreams if the Velvet Revolution would not arrived in my country. So that was extremely important that uh, Velvet Revolution changed, changed the regime and brought us uh, democracy and freedom, which uh, so many people were longing for. Maybe if we can just go down the, the row then um, to give us a sense of, of what, what you were doing 30 years ago. Uh, good evening. Thank you for, for the invitation and possibility to participate here. Uh, I was 21, I was in fourth year medical school, uh, and uh, I was part of the group which organized uh, the culture club uh, in, in my uh, school from wild birthday parties to more sophisticated poetry reading and concerts of the bands which could not record. And uh, in the late 80s, uh, we finally were able to get them on small venues like the uh, student clubs. And we exchanged some prohibited books and felt like uh, very much an underground, but we were quite uh, cautious uh, and uh, we were not part of the dissident movement at that moment. But uh, uh, we knew that the, uh, uh, our colleagues from other uh, schools were organizing the 17th of November. So we canvassed our friends and colleagues to go uh, and, and participate. Did not know what, what it's going to trigger. But it was fantastic to uh, be able uh, to be there when, when the history was written. And uh, uh, I was on the 17th of November uh, among the last few people who were trying to escape. Uh, and I'm two meters tall, six foot six, and over 200 pounds. And I, I, uh, uh, I just wanted to go home uh, because I was threatened for my just physical safety. and. The, the crowd moved me without one step, you know, two meters here, two meters there. And uh, so uh, I was lucky that I picked up a, a big bag of uh, fresh laundry uh, from my mom. And so I, I had uh, my bag covered and uh, I got only beaten over my legs. But my, my colleague and, and roommate, he got beaten over his head and lost his conscious. And, and the, the, the policeman was about to hit him again and, and his girlfriend who was with us uh, scream from top of her lungs and then I pushed him down and then a few people kind of uh, got in between us so we dragged him uh, away and and went to the hospital and and uh, uh, our teacher our group teacher was on duty and he was a neurologist and he said I'm not gonna put him on the books because then the secret police gonna come and even probably throw him uh, out of out of the school. So he said, you're going to take him back to the drone uh, and you're going to observe him because we don't want him uh, to go unconscious, maybe in case he has an uh, internal bleeding. So we brought a big pot of uh, coffee and Boris brought, uh, he's from Slovakia, he brought a big bottle of Slovitz and we were sitting on the steps and saying that revolution is nothing for us because with Craig Hat, you know, you're going to do you know, much of uh, positive for anybody, and 
uh, with the night drinking coffee and, and uh, lots of of this Lewitz, uh, we, we, we grew a little bit of um, courage and we said uh, we should do something that, that other people would not be afraid anymore. And the day after, when he heard that uh, one of the students were presumably dead, we went and canvassing each one of the block and, and, and joined uh, the protest again and, uh, and organized the strike committee in the medicine. And on, on Monday, uh, I was reading the 10, uh, 10 points which the uh, students uh, formulated as, as uh, requirements for us uh, towards the Communist Party, and the rest is the history. Okay. Well, good evening, good evening, everybody. I should start by saying that no, not all revolutions end happily. Uh, that was actually very much on our minds when we started this in November '89. We started just five months after Tiananmen in Beijing, where they just killed a couple thousand people. So we were scared. I would even say we were scared shitless, but this is university, so I shouldn't speak in profane language. Uh, I happened to be seen by my colleagues as a sort of expert on secret police because I was the first to be lucky enough to be detained in summer 88, and I got three to eight years promise, promise of prison, which I really didn't want to attend. And uh, when uh, we got beaten on no November 17, uh, we were just terrified that next time they would, just, they would shoot us. That's why we called for the strike on the next morning, on the 18th. But it was basically a hopeless task. I mean, we assumed that most of the faculties and schools would not join us because it was risky. And then we actually got lucky to some extent that uh, the fake news about somebody actually dying there spread out the following days. And I think that broke the taboo of not attending demonstrations for most people. Because uh, without that, God knows what would, ha what would happen. Uh, I was appointed, elected among the students' committee, basically because, as my colleagues used to say, your life is already over, which was very kind of them. And uh, it was amazing the speed of the change. That's true, because we started the strike on Monday, the 20th of November. And on Friday, the Politburo, the communist leadership, fell down. In the same time, it was also amazing to watch how quickly people forget about realities, because the strike ended in December when Václav Havel became president. But the physical realities remained pretty much the same for a couple of months more. We had 140,000 Soviet troops on our territory. It took one and a half year to get them out. We had 6,000 people in the secret police. And uh, I was lucky enough to be involved in this bending of that. And it took a couple of months after Mats of Havel was elected. So, you know, revolutions can be quick, but they can also, they also last. And once again, I would just stress that we were extremely lucky. Our predecessors in 48 and 68 got either killed or arrested or detained for a long time. We were lucky enough to fly to Los Angeles to talk to you. And I would just leave a silent memory for those who died in Beijing. I know it's politically not the right thing to do these days. China is mighty, but they will be always on our minds. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I am certainly proud to sit among these wonderful um, very young men at the time during a period that uh, actually I'm probably the oldest person up here because my time in Czechoslovakia goes back 50 years. Uh, my parents were immigrants. They were from Czech and Slovak backgrounds. And uh, one of 13 children. And uh, I, I'm always fond of saying that uh, we were so poor, they just forgot to tell us. And we looked at the world in a, in a larger way. So that made me always think of my writing as a poet and a playwright toward me or someone like Václav Havel, whose work was already integrating itself into our, our culture and into our art and our theaters. Uh, 
So I had it in me to be a dissident here in America during the Vietnam period. I marched in the civil rights marches for the feminist uh, rights marches for the ecology. That background here during the 60s took me over to Czechoslovakia around 63. Uh, and I still remember how I would go to my villages. I got a student Fulbright, which gave me a, a internship at Time Magazine or at a publishing house in Munich. I chose Munich because I thought Munich, Bratislava, my villages. So I went there, and as soon as I arrived, I heard the worst and saw the worst of what communism could do to a country, uh, to farmers, basically. I remember people walking around saying to me, shh, communism is no good. Everybody whispered it. Communism is no good. And everyone fearful in their own families. My own cousin was ostracized from his family, and I liked going on the motorcycle with him always. But they said, you must never be with Peter again. He's carrying a communist card. I then began to write against the regime. I remember later in 1984, having a Fulbright to Slovenia, the ambassador came to me and said, listen, James, you don't have to do this, but we know you're going to do a candlelight reading in a basement in Bratislava. I just looked, how do you know this? <laughs> Will you agree to take in 10 Time magazines and 10 Newsweek magazines in the fake bottom of a suitcase? And I remember that began my whole time in Czechoslovakia, I said, yes, I will do it, and I did it. You should have seen people grabbing for truth, grabbing for these magazines. The propaganda was such that all I remember being in the villages in America today, and they would have Bratislava too, and I think probably on the TVs, we would only see what they would allow us to see. I then got banned with my work, and I'll just tell you one incident. Uh, my poetry was banned, I was not allowed. I had to report to police stations. Uh, always, uh, the fear of being arrested was always there, so I did get put under house arrest. But I had an American passport, which is the only thing that saved me. But I still remember being called in to Humana, into a library. And the woman asked me, what is your book doing on the shelf? And I didn't know, I thought probably my cousin put it there. She put out, she pulled out scissors, opened the book, and she cut out a poem I had written about Jan Pollock, scissored out another poem that I had written about Jan Zaitz, scissored out a poem that I had written about Dubček, another poem about the actual invasion, threw the poems into the trash, put the book back on the shelf and said, now it can remain. And until something like that happens, it's such a graphic presentation of censorship. You really absolutely appreciate what you have in this country. And it was common and constant. But I'll, I'll pick up more later. I'll hear Pop later now. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, it Actually, that film made me really emotional because I didn't really realize how suddenly when you see this, it reminds me how I was young and pretty <laughs> and, and not bitter at all and uh, hopeful, <laughs> which I thought that once we will be the communists, how great everything will be. Um, so I actually do know, Elizabeth, exactly what I did 30 years ago this day because I was actually in the studio of KCRW in Los Angeles. And, um, and I was actually invited by, at that time, uh, a commentator called Ruth Hirschman. And uh, she would ask me some, I don't remember how she got me as my number or how did I get there. But um, what she asked me if it's possible because I was pretty much plugged into the Czech society at the time if I can call some of these actors um, who are actually doing the revolution and we can directly talk to them and see what's going on, which we did. So we called Divadlo Nazar Bradley, we called all these other places because I knew all these actors because I was a director and I, you know, was also dating one of the very famous actors at that time from Divadlo Nazar Bradley. 
And um, the only problem at that time in America was that most of these actors who were amazing, incredible actors did not speak any English, so which I didn't realize at the time that would be a big deal. But, um, um, y y you know, so, so after that, my bad luck was because I was here in Los Angeles only three days. And it took me so long to actually go to the dream country because I was accepted to AFI in 1985. I couldn't come, um, you know, because I would have to immigrate. I was accepted in when I was 17 years old to um, Franklin College in Switzerland. I got a full scholarship. I could not come. My parents would say no. So I always this this was a big dream for me to. Um, one day make it, and I can't believe I got on a Panam flight on <laughs> November uh, November 14, and which after we went out of business and went actually to LA. And then after this, after this experience, I actually flew back because I was so excited that I have to be back part of it. I uh, started to work with Minister of Foreign Affairs, and we kind of independently recovering. Uh, uh, Mr. Dean Spear, who at that time was mini, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And um, and so how I got there, the first place, so I can explain a very short version of it. I graduated FAMU in 1985, and right after that, I actually uh, became probably, at that time, the only female uh, young generation, upcoming, talented, you know, director in, in, in Czech television, which was definitely a center of propaganda in our country at the time. I was never a member of a communist party and I did speak English. And I actually first two uh, project that I did in 1985 and 86 actually was uh, talking about the, um, about a violence in our country. So right away I became on the map of like, this is the new generation, the new wave. My film, was the second one that I did a documentary about. This was right away banned, and it wasn't, you know, we were not able, to, I mean, they told me that it not, was not going to be able to show, be shown. And then in, uh, I, I think, I believe it was 1986. I was trying to find that date exactly, but I remember that the night of Mr. Gorbachev coming to Prague, uh, the night before he came, they actually called me and they said, we're going to have a special screening of your documentary, which was a 70 minutes documentary about our country. And, and, and they showed a prison at the time of, of the socialist prison. So it was a big deal. ZDF picked it up right after. And, and, and I remember that was the time that I, for me, felt there's some change coming along the way. Because, um, you know, growing up, this is really interesting for me because we have these different generations here sitting with the, my incredible panelists and everybody has a different emotional experience, how they remember the revolution and how, where were they and how old were they. But um, for, for me, who was a child, I was born 1960. So for me, I felt like my, my parents talk about the Second World War, which was only 15 years after I was born, I'm like, what are they talking about so long time ago? 15 years, nothing. So so here I was born and, you know, I was, my dad was a really f pretty established, famous director. I didn't really pay attention too much to politics, I have to say. We were always watched, it's true. We were always, you know, our phone was always bugged. But I just kind of always fun with this weirdly. My dad was scared, but I was like, okay, here they're listening again, it's okay. And 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 so I was in that, you know, kind of didn't really um think about it till till I started to work myself. And and um and I started to work myself, I started to work in the te television and and all the microphones were backed and every, you know, people knew basically what we're doing. Then I was um, uh, invited to a secret service the police to uh, for interrogation. And when I got there, which I was trying to avoid that clearly, because I was like, okay, I, I don't want to go. But then you couldn't really cancel. That was the weird thing, because there's no number you can cancel. So you have to show up, because you know if you don't show up, you, you, you might end up in some troubles later. 
So I did go there. And uh, and it was a two-hour situation, exactly how we see in the movies. It was a good guy and a bad guy. And and what, what, what was for me the most opening moment of actually probably one of the most opening moment of my life because the file on me I was like at that time maybe 25 the file was about this fat so when they asked me about questions when what I was doing when I was 15 and 16 and I rem didn't remember it clearly it, it was like how did you even get there and it, and 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 that was such a reality for for me where you realize that you know your whole life was basically a movie for somebody else and so after two years i mean two hours of this terrible uh, interrogation where i felt that my eeg was like constantly like going and I'm thinking, okay, how do I get out of this? Because it was very clear at the end of this, because I, at the end of this, I said, what do you want from me? And they said, well, you speak English, you establish people like you, so we will call you back. We will call you back because we want you to work with us. And I said, I can work with you. I, you know, in, in my mind, I was thinking, I wish CIA would you know, connect me and not you us, but I couldn't say that. And and, and, and they said, well, we know where you live. We'll find you. You know, it's OK. We'll find you. Here's your, you know, we, we can take your passport away. I know you were traveling. And, you know, you, we, we just know how to get you. We will get you. So, so after that, I actually remember walking back to work, which was the center of the propaganda, Czechoslovak television. And I knew that, that all the mics are bugged. So um, I came to the set. Everybody was ready. The actors were there. We were, you know. And I started instead of directing, I said, into the mic, I said, "So I just want to tell you guys that I was an STB today. It was really interesting because they asked me about you and you and you and you, and I didn't know what to say because maybe I didn't know anything about you. But you should let me know what you think I should be saying. Anyway, I said everything that Mike." knowing that somebody is listening to this. And that was actually probably something that saved me at the time from that incredible harassment that was about to come because, because they realized that I'm absolutely unreliable <laughs> and not able to be part of STV. And But I can imagine people who did not say anything, who did have children, and, uh, and you know who uh, it, it was it, it was incredibly hard and i don't blame today anybody for whatever they did because it, it was clearly terrible and so so anyway i really appreciate where i am <laughs> how you know i appreciate you guys because i i work with uh, i oh and one more thing interesting about my, my situation was that i live on Venceslav square so I was living with, as I said, his name was Vladimir Lohi. He was a famous actor, and um, and uh, and you know I was when Václav Havel brought the petition in nine, uh, 1989 called in Czech Nikolik Viet few sentences. I was one of the first one who signed it because he gave it to me right away. And I remember it was, as you guys said, it was very scary. It wasn't, today we feel like, you know, pers you, you know, it wasn't a big deal, but it actually was very scary at that time. Because as I said uh, yesterday, it would take one airplane to Siberia and no revolution would ever happen. That's all it would take one airplane, 200 people. So, so, so anyway, you know, Havel, Václav Havel came many times to our uh, house, and uh, so I knew him very well before the revolution, and, um, and, and it was an incredible event, so I'm really happy he became a president, and I'm really happy where we are here. Thank you. So I, I want to... <laughs> 
So I want to pick up on, on some of what a number of you have, have talked about in terms of emotions. Um, uh, Pavlina, you talked about it, the sort of scariness of being interrogated by the STB. Um, uh, Václav, you also talked about, you know, that it was a scary time. Um, and, and Jan, you're sort of, we don't, we don't want to go back out to get our, our heads cracked open and we'll stay here in our culture club and not, not be politicized in some ways. So what was the, the, the mood of the time that moved you through those fears or out of that kind of, we're just going to be countercultural, but maybe not political, um, into really becoming political activists and, and leaders of the, the student movement? I mean, what were, what were the hopes and the goals that inspired you to, to persist in that? I think for me personally, uh... It was such a black and white situation. Uh, it was so clear what was what was the truth, what was lie, what was basically good, and what was what was evil. And uh, I guess it was up to the generation which was born in '68 when our fathers and moms were stopped in the by the tanks that we are the next generation of naive idealists who are not confronted with the regime as yet uh, and uh, it's usually the young people who basically go and uh, say the, the caesar is naked he doesn't have no clothes and and everybody knew it uh, they were just afraid to say it out loud publicly and uh, we just didn't give them the chance not to support us you know, and we went to our hometowns, uh, and uh, we have raised the emotions and the hope that uh, if they support us this time, that we will all overcome it. Even though, as Václav said, uh, I, you know, I was trying to to keep myself as busy as possible, not to think about the fear I did have all the time. You know, it was only to basically push a little bit further, and the fact that. We were so right, and they were so wrong, and even uh, what was something which, which at least gave me always the little bit of nudge to go and m make the one step further. And maybe just one word, which is desperation. <laughs> no, people usually don't risk their lives unless they really have to, and we all have a lot to lose. And it would be stupid for most of us to actually get involved in anything dangerous. So I think desperation is pretty useful if you want to start a revolution. In our case, it was by being pushed, pushed too hard by the police and the secret police. And also desperation because the change was already happening in Poland, Hungary, and East Germany. The wall, the Berlin Wall, fell down in early November. And nothing was still happening in my, in our, in my country. So the desperation that actually we might remain the Skansen, you know, the, the, the old communist, whatever, open air museum, open yeah. Air museum <laughs> yeah. That was a terrifying thought because we did not belong to Mongolia, we belonged to Europe. So a desperation that actually our future can be taken away from us, that we will simply have no future. Yeah. I think, um... <laughs> I think the question is well put in terms of the emotions and the fear. Uh, in my family, my grandfather from my mother's side died in a concentration camp. Um, and uh, not because he was Jewish, he was just because of the war that was going on, taken from a siege and into a camp, and we, we lost him there. Something about that always drove me to take on all people, totalitarian or anyone that threatens freedom. And what happened to me on the morning, I'm going to go back to uh, uh, August 21st in 1968. I was there in my villages. To make you understand what fear can be is to have your, your aunt and uncle, uncle waking you in the middle of the night, screaming, risky to Prisky, the Russians have invaded, the Russians have invaded. And it's like waking here in Los Angeles and someone saying that to you. I was, what, what are you talking about? We, we got no news what was happening up with Dubček, no, no news about what was happening in Prague. And now they're packing my suitcase, my Olivetti, everything. I had been writing against, the, I had been writing quite a bit against all of that. Packing everything into a suitcase 
And I, I, I can remember being on a buckboard with one horse and a dog named Bossy and two uh, lanterns on the front going up through the hills down to the town in Fomena, coming into dawn in the daylight and seeing the tanks, the tanks there. And you don't know what's happening. Now, my, my uncle was trying to get me on that train because I wasn't supposed to fly out for another two weeks in Prague. And he's trying to talk them into it. And these are Russian soldiers holding, you know, guns. And now I knew some Russian. I started asking in my Russian, my bad Russian, and they would, would not. They took my suitcase and everything, took me up in and locked me in a bathroom. And then the train starts taking off. This is about fear. The train starts taking off. I thought they forgot about me. No, I was under house arrest and I didn't know it. Eight hours I was in that bathroom and the train was moving. When they brought me out, there was only one other person in that car. I had khaki clothes, so I would look very foreign. And the other person, we weren't allowed to talk. We did not know what happened. Why would the Russians invade a friendly country like Slovakia? And we finally got into Bratislava, and I'll never forget them taking us off the train, giving me back my, my suitcase. It looked like a bad B movie, all my clothes hanging out, no typewriter, all my paperwork and gone. And was making us go on this bus. And I suddenly knew what it was to be Jewish without being Jewish. Don't get on that bus. I had Bobby R. Yevtushenko was a good friend of mine. He always read Bobby R. In, in Russian, and I read it in English all over the world. We read together, and I said, don't get on that bus. And then you do. You still don't know what's going to happen, but you're asking for just a little more time. And they kicked us out into Vienna. The bus went out into Vienna. We all rushed to the newspapers. The Herald, it was the International Herald was still being published. And, and we read all of it. And we all wanted to go back in and fight. That was my... Thank you. I think for me it was determination and adrenaline. Because by October 28th, I, because I was living on Wenceslas Square, we got a drink, we went down, and we knew that we will be troubles, and we were. And I was arrested, and, and I still remember that I was trying to beat up about four police officers. They carried me, <laughs> each holding one of my arms and legs, right across from Wenceslas Square to the you know, bus. And I remember thinking, it doesn't really matter what they do to me. They have to leave. They have to be gone. And 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 I was, you know, and 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 I remember that that adrenaline was so strong because I guess we were young, and 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 determined. And um, and that was that was for a lot of people also the main drive where we got where we were for the young people. I think. Tatiana, do you think that um, people in, in your generation can identify with these kinds of, of feelings of fear and desperation, or is it it's much more different growing up in a much in a more optimistic time? I mean, how do you how do you orient yourself uh, to these sorts of uh, stories? Yeah, well, absolutely. But we've heard stories, you know, from parents, grandparents. So I can definitely um, tell that. Everything they told us were was like crazy, and I, I would probably leave the country. I think that living in such a uh, <laughs> crazy times where everything was hard. I mean, you couldn't go study if you were not part of the party, um, etc. It it must been crazy. I, I just cannot imagine living. Uh, like that, so I understand uh, that many people just had to go and leave and find home somewhere else, which I find extremely brave. And um, yeah, as I said, my my family went through a lot. Uh, they survived two Second World Wars. They survived Nazi occupation and then whole communist era. And I remember very hard times. My Grandma was telling me that um, 
the whole family was persecuted for a long time. Um, Would you say that your generation of, of Czechs are, are optimistic or are they cynical? I mean, <laughs> um, I would say both. I see that Czech society and Czech people are very much devoted these days. Um, young people would definitely cancel Communist Party. Um, I think so. Mm -hmm. Most of the young uh, people from, from our generation. And then, uh, of course, we realize that all the freedom we have, it's, it's amazing, but there is also a lot of depression uh, because what, what's happening, what we can see at the moment is a lot of extremism and aggression in, in our society. And um, but still, I think that young people believe in independence of justice and law, and they they believe that the media uh, are are in, is are independent. Mm -hmm. So, but it's like a worldwide trend. I mean, look at America, the longest democracy in the world, and what's happening is really happening worldwide. So I hope that democracy will actually survive that. It's not just in my country, it's everywhere, yeah. yeah and I hope we can return to that uh, later, but I, I, I do want to, um, I know that the film talks about the Velvet Revolution as a term that refers to a peaceful and nonviolent revolution, that's part of it, but I've always also associated it, and I don't think I'm the only one, um, with the idea of the Velvet Revolution as the Velvet Curtain of the theater, um, and the, the role that culture and theater and the arts um, played as a force for change um, in this revolution, uh, both in the, the, the people involved and in some of the leaders, but um, also in the roles even that the theaters played as uh, spaces where people came together and talked and, and, and kind of sustained some of the moment, momentum that the students had, had built up. Uh, and so I'm wondering, and particularly maybe Pavlina and James um, as artists themselves, how, did, how do you see culture as a force of change? I mean, you talked a little bit about censorship, but also as a, a force of change and a powerful force of change. Uh, let me just say this just happened recently. Uh, this is the true definition of irony. You'll hear the story. Uh, I was coming through Old Town Square in Prague, and they had the booths up, and it was the Communist Party had a booth up. And then there was a very patriotic Czech booth right next to it. But as I turned the corner, I was off to teach my uh, class at Charles University. A huge fight broke out between the two booths. I mean, they, it was bloody. It was on the ground. It was so violent, I just passed right by it, people trying to stop it. This is just two years ago. Came, turned the corner, and walking toward me were three young girls of about 15 years old, I think, with signs hanging from their necks, free hugs. They looked at me and said, do you need a hug? I said, yeah. <laughs> and they gave me the hugs. I went into my class and I said, do you want to know irony, violence, love? So this is what I like about what Tatiana also said in terms of the youth. I saw that and I knew that the youth were going to be another new generation that we were when we were, when we were younger. But anyway, I wanted to just say that part. But what drove me is uh, also my meeting with Havel himself. Um, I had been writing against the regime. He knew about that. He called for a meeting when he came here uh, for a lecture he had to give and to meet with the, uh, I guess he had to uh, do the Congress. And, and the first thing he did was put his hand out to me and said, we are colleagues. And that just made me want to go back every summer and write more theater. He would always say to me, James, why aren't they doing your play here? Because my play had been done in Moscow, had been done in Paris, everywhere. Why aren't they doing your plays here? And I said, because they're doing all of yours. <laughs> <laughs> there were no theaters open. It was true. <laughs> any rate, the, the idea of um, seeing hope through the newer generation really uh, inspired me to do the writing I started doing after that. To answer your question, I think for me, the most important part of it was that, you know, growing up, we always had to fill up a paperwork and every application we were going through for schools or jobs, and it would always say farmer, worker, and everything else, right? So I was always everything else. 
because my parents were educated. And, and I think, going back to your question, I think that the interesting part of the revolution was that basically we needed to convince the working class that this is the right move. Because there was always traditionally kind of animosity between, a little bit between the two classes, I mean, you know, the, the classes, because workers always believe because there's so much power that we're working for you guys, because if you wouldn't have my coal, I, you couldn't be a doctor, you know? So there was always this, and we always were, intellectuals were always a little bit taken as not serious on that part. So so I think at that time, what happened, because it did happen through an intellectual source. So that's why the actors had to actually go to convince the working class to get on the board and get the revolution going, because they knew if they get the working class on board, there has will be a revolution, because then they will not go back as long as not becoming just an intellectual movement. And I think that that was a big part of it. You know, I think sometimes we tend to think about um, something like the the Prague Revolution, or Prague, uh, the Velvet Revolution. Sorry, um, as as very time bound and celebratory. Uh, that you know, Yakish and Hushak are gone, and and Havel is is there. Um, and uh, Václav, I appreciated how your point about how it, it didn't end at the end of December. There was still a very long transition, uh, and and you and Jan were both part of that transition. Uh, could you speak about some of the challenges or some of your greatest? I mean, the greatest success I think is obviously dismantling the secret police. But beyond that, the greatest successes, but also maybe are, were there disappointments? Well, okay, well, successes. Uh, I would say that uh, the two of us and the others who came to power, so to speak, we knew nothing about how to run the country, obviously. Not, not only because of the age, but also because we were not part of the nomenclature. And I, uh, I think the best illustration of what really happened and how fast it happened is my favorite one is uh, when the Civic Forum went to see the Czech Prime Minister because it was Czechoslovak federal government, it was the Czech and Slovak Republic. So in early December, they go to see the Czech Prime Minister of the Czech Socialist Republic, basically with the idea that he might appoint one of the deputy ministers could be from the Civic Forum. And he gave them the tour of the government building, saying, well, here is the archive, here is a secret phone room, here we meet. Here's my office, and here are the keys. <laughs> and left. And Peter Pedhart, who was one of the Civic Forum leaders, but intellectual, very nice, kind man, but let's be honest, no manager, became the Czech Prime Minister. And then you suddenly start calling people. It's like, well, what are you doing next week? Wow. How would you like to be a minister of defense <laughs> or agriculture? Do you, know, do you know something about health? You know, it sounds funny, but you know, I, 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 was, I was elected by parliament on November 29, and my last detention was November 19 of the same year, so 10 days later. And in mid January, I was given the powers from the leaders of the parliament to actually go into the secret police and we started to dis dismantle it. You know, if Václav would ask us in mid-November, late November, well, please do this band secret police, I would say, okay, well, let's do it. Where they are, where are they? I mean, we knew, we knew, where, they, we knew where the interrogations would, would take place and we knew where the prisons were, but nothing else. You know, where are the offices, which people belong to that. So we had to learn. So. I would have, I have no disappointments, to be honest. I think we did what we could. Uh, if we did mistakes, yeah, sure we did mistakes. I mean, people do mistakes all the time and we knew nothing about how to run the country. If, with all respect to, 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 to you here, if you were suddenly appointed to run California, you would manage somehow. It would take you a couple months, maybe years to learn. You would make a few mistakes, but you would learn it in the end. People can learn a lot. We were basically in the same situation as you would be if you were supposed to run your country. 
So it was shock in, this, in many ways. It also brought many excellent people forward. And what was really interesting, and I, I, would, I, I would like to stress this very much, uh, we in Prague, the capital, pretty much ignored the rest of the country. Sounds familiar? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And thanks to revolution, we realized that there are people like us across the country. And you know, it's nice, nice of you to have us here, but to start a strike in a provincial city, that was a courage. I mean, for us, you know, we, we got beaten, we, we, we remembered what happened, but for somebody far away from Prague to start their own small self civic forum, to be the first to go to the square in a small Czech or Slovak town and say, let's start the strike. Wow, that's something. That's really something. And we suddenly found out that people in the countryside actually don't have two heads and four legs. I mean, there are people like us, and they had actually the same wishes. That was the greatest, greatest lesson for us. And we tend to forget it, people in the capitals tend to forget it to their own peril. Yeah. I was asked, uh, Václav and myself, we served on the uh, first uh, parliamentary committee, which uh, started to, uh, as a part of the student demands, uh, parliament formed a committee uh, from some par parliament members, some students and some, uh, some uh, lawyers from, from uh, Civic Forum. And uh, because we had experienced parliament about 10 days, I was asked to become one of the parliament members on the district where my medical school was located in Prague 5. And I couldn't sleep for three nights. And I went to the, uh, one of the lawyers, uh, wise man who then became a minister of justice, Ota Motel, and I said, Ota, I mean, I'm 21. I don't know anything about the world. Uh, and now I'm supposed to regulate somebody's life. Uh, what do I do, you know? And he said, ah, forget about it. He said, I have seen you, you know, making opinion, giving, giving, you know, uh, uh, making decisions. So we need some young people without old baggage who just would use a common sense. So please accept it and run with it, you know, and call the shots as they come. And uh, so the first half a year, the, the interim parliament was basically, again, it was so black and white uh, that it couldn't be more, uh, I would say, clear, because we were only dismantling the old regime. We were, uh, you know, uh, canceling the, the uh, rule of one party. We were preparing first free elections in June. We were preparing privatization. We were trying to... Uh, basically prepare some of the rectification of all injustices like restitution that the property which were stolen by the uh, uh, by the communists would be given back uh, to the original owners or their their uh, uh, children and funny enough uh, uh, basically any revolution and any partial uh, mitigation of all uh, sins basically creates new injustices. Because you will have to always draw a line where you're gonna give the property back. Uh, are you gonna give it to, 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 to the Jewish families which been, which been sent to Auschwitz? Or where, where you could draw the line? Because administratively you have to make it somehow an end to it. So, uh, uh, our parent generation got the short stick again. They've been born just before World War II. Then, then, then they've been stopped in 68. Father was kicked out of the university, was working as a laborer. And then he wanted to do, uh, he wanted to teach again. They said, but your PhD is 20 years old, out of date. He said, duh. <laughs> you know, and, and because the people who were judging him were the ones who kicked him out of the university. So uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, you have to accept that, that even, uh, I would say that each change basically creates even more injustice, but you have to take it and run with it forward. And I was very glad that Václav Havel said we are not like them, that you cannot establish rule of law uh, by violating the law to start with. Uh, you have to be much more generous towards your oppressors and even to give them the, the rights of citizens uh, in, to really start a democracy on, on, uh, on equal grounds and rule of law. I think we did not have any other chance, and I'm glad we have done it. I want to 
to jump forward um, and and kind of pick up on something that Tatiana had had mentioned, but also, I mean, as a, an American in this political context in the United States and and seeing Brexit in in the UK, um, and as a historian of of, of Central Europe, um, looking at the rise of the uh, AfD in Germany. Uh, law and justice in Poland, Fidesz in Hungary. Um, there's been a, a real turn away from the sort of principles and values that I think informed the revolutions of 1989 in, in then Czechoslovakia and elsewhere, and and towards populist um, governments, more authoritarian models of rule uh, in some countries. You know, the suppression of the the independent courts, independent judiciary, the suppression of the press, the academy. Um, and certainly the rise of some pretty strong nationalist and xenophobic um, movements. Um, now, those, I think, developments have been much more acute and have gone much farther down the line in places like Poland and Hungary, but Czech Republic's also not been immune from some of those things. Uh, and so I'm wondering how you, how all of you um, look at uh, the politics both of the Czech Republic and Europe more generally today um, I was struck, and I can't remember, uh, I think it was you, Václav, who said, you know, we're not Mongolia, we're Europe. But what does it mean to be part of Europe now? <laughs> I mean, um, so how do you, I mean, at a time when we do celebrate all of the, the accomplishments of the revolution, it, how do we also look at the present? And are we perhaps in need of a, re not, maybe not a revolution, but a revitalization or something? Um, and so I don't know who wants to field that first, but I'm going to throw that one out there. <laughs> I'm someone else. To, all, to everyone, <laughs> to everyone, <laughs> it's to everyone. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, it's. It, I don't think we can avoid the question about the present when we look back at the past. Well, okay, <laughs> okay, I will start again. Um, as I said, you know, it's important that Velvet Revolution brought us a freedom, but there are still many people in charge who has a uh, huge influence and there are people from the past. So actually a lot of Czechs are demotivated and uh, disappointed um, that way, especially younger generation. So what's happening at the moment back in Czech Republic, you could see uh, demonstrations and it's not just in my country, it's all over as you mentioned, but uh, it's it's pretty, pretty clear that people are unhappy with what's happening and that they're willing to change it. So um, I'm wondering myself what's going to happen next year uh, and what, what it all means. But I think that our political elite should definitely react on that. Back in 89, I think we, we, we wanted freedom. But uh, as uh, I think the current situation shows, uh, a huge portion of the population basically mistaken freedom with with better material uh, situation with uh, with cons better consumerism, and uh, uh, I don't think that you could you could uh, have freedom uh, without assuming the duties of citizenship, of every day taking care of uh, uh, your environment and and, and a portion of uh, what is going around you, and. Uh, but it's not it's not unique uh, to Czech Republic or, or uh, Europe. It's it's around here. The the, the division uh, among people who still would like to desert to a I would say a strong man who has all the answers and people who are willing to think critically. You know, today you ask somebody what time it is, they say three o'clock, and they the reply is it's your opinion. You know, uh, the relativity uh, the the uh, of values and and disregard for facts rather than opinions is something which is uh, something which which causes these divisions and uh, uh, the fact that lots of people uh, are not seeking uh, I would say source of information and that they they are not seeking the data uh, the facts rather than uh, opinions and and uh, the uh, the social media are locking us up in our own bubbles. Uh, before, people in a small village, they were forced to come to the same pub. And even though they didn't like your opinions, they had to kind of get to know more about you and actually uh, reason with you and get along. Uh, 
Now we keep uh, kind of uh, in our own bubbles and they, we're getting more and more convinced of our, own, of our own truth. And there's not much communication and, and actually learning about why do you have that opinion? Why do you feel this way? You know, so I think this is, this is the challenge of today to actually reach out and, and actually understand uh, why I disagree or I, uh, why I uh, beg to disagree, but, but I try to understand why you feel this way, why, why you're convinced that, that you have the truth, even though we come from the same facts. So first of all, Let's remind ourselves that we are, we, we are lucky enough to live in the lucky part of the world. That's actually in itself pretty important. There was an old Soviet joke how the Soviet citizen and American citizen meet. And you know, the common question, how are you? And the Soviet says, well, I, I, can't, I can't complain. <laughs> and the American says, I can. <laughs> and there, there is a lot to it. So we are lucky enough to live in the richest part of the world, both Europe and US. And yes, we, we do complain a lot, and we have plenty of reasons to complain about. I teach at NYU in Prague, and we had a major complaint a couple of years back because Prague only has about 20 types of yogurt, while New York has about 70. And you know, it's unbearable to live in a country which has only 20 types of yogurt. Basically, life is impossible there. And, uh, I guess that goes with it. We should keep in mind that our system creates both winners and losers. We are generally living in a bubble which is mostly successful. I suppose most of you in this, in this room made it, made it. There are probably plenty in your country, just like in mine, who don't think that they made it. And they resent the system. From the Brexit vote that you mentioned to your lovely elections in 2016, there's a lot of disconnect and discontent. And we had the same in my country. And I keep saying in 2017, in our country, 60% of the people voted for, for protest parties in a country with the lowest unemployment in the EU and pretty good economic growth. So if you study political science, throw out the books you have because they are no longer valid. There is something going on much deeper and much more serious. But as long as we can complain, and don't no don't get arrested for that. I think we're fine. <laughs> um, as someone who believes in the arts, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. Uh, I know how much I've put into that word truth. It's on, in every line I write. It's in every work that I go to visit, whether I read it or watch it. Uh, and the word uh, compassion always comes through something that seems to have been lost, something that we need to get back to. Persistence. I know this because this group right here, who, who really were there, I was there through 68 and all the way up until uh, 89 and further. I was not there for that portion of it. But I know and believe in change. I was invited when the Parkland students were shot and killed. Would I come down and do a poetry reading and talk to some of the people, survivors and the parents? I, cu I couldn't believe what I was watching. I got 51 letters. My daughters will tell you because they, I got 51 letters of thank you, not for coming, but for something I said. I said to them, the most important word in your vocabulary will always be the word yes. Don't ever allow anyone to always put that no on you. Always. No, I'm not good enough. No, it happens to someone else. No, I'm not ready. It is your time. That group wrote me letters because they're the ones who did the March for Our Lives. They're the ones that went out and had gun legislation changed in Florida. They're the ones who went and got 40 more people into a Congress by helping through voting and all. Persistence, something I knew during the 60s and 70s that made all the changes for civil rights. Everything that changed that day, and I was like all of you, I was celebrating 89. I was looking, I'm, I'm, I was working on a film called The Shoe, which opens with the tanks coming up Wenceslas Square. And it was, I was hired by George Clooney's company at the time to write this film. And uh, it's finished now. 
And, and I just learned before coming back from Prague this time that there's a feature film being done about Václav Havel. It's, being, it's finished. They asked if I would be a, a, a reader on it. I read it and gave them notes on it. These are people that are putting, whether it's film, whether it's on the written page, the idea that you persist, the idea that you believe in truth, you never give up on it. This is why I love journalists. They will keep at you with it. And this is why I like the artists, the poets, the playwrights and all. Havel, when he said to me, he says, you know, nothing disappears, but so your deeds. Your deeds. What are you doing? Just as you're saying, what are you doing? How can you act to change what essentially seems unchangeable? It is. It happens, and it's happening right now. There's a youth coming through. Believe in them. Don't pick on the millennials. <laughs> they're going to be fun. You watch. They're going to come through for you. <laughs> and I believe in the youth, as I do in my generation and yours and the rest. You know, uh, I, I came through some of the worst. Uh, I watched my brothers come back from the wars and, and wounded and, um, and, and watched so many black uh, friends who, who were died and put in prisons and the rest of it, and you make those changes. But don't lose that word truth, and don't, don't, don't lose that word compassion and that other beautiful word called passion. Be passionate about it. I'm going back to a question, what is it to be Czech and nationalism, because I think about it a lot lately. Um, my kids are 20 years old, so there's a lot of debate between our generations. Um, and, and I think with this incredible nation of 10 million people, and, and I think it's something that very special to say you're Czech, and I'll tell you why, because I cannot write, and, and there's there's somebody in the room who knows this exactly, who's just Tara right there, who we write together. Who is she? She's his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I write script in Czech, it's funny, it's 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 fun, it's great. I can, it's not the same script as in English. We literally are writing two different scripts because there's something about Czech culture that is so specific that's untranslatable. You know, and, and I love that. I, when, I, when I read it, and it's so funny, there's no way that I can say the same thing in English. It will be different, but you know, it's not true. So um, I think we're a very special country. I look at the room, there's so many achievers in this room that I know personally. And it's a very smart and funny nation because we were always in the middle of near Central Europe and then every single tribe that ever went through probably kind of tried to kill us and we had to survive. So we don't like to fight. That's why we have Velvet Revolution because if we would fight, we would be killed all. So we kind of solved the problem with little being little not as brave as we would like to be and with sense of humor. And... Uh, so, so here we are, and it goes back to the question about the whole nationalism that I'm thinking, because I do feel Amer I'm an American citizen, and I, you know, I live here, I have my family here, and I do feel American, but at the same time, I feel very Czech. And, um, and, 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 and what does it really mean? What it means is, uh, as much as I enjoy being here and understand why a lot of people left Europe to be here, because you do feel very differently, it's a big community, and within that large community, you find your own community that you can relate to. It, it, it can either be religious or it can be, you know, going back to your roots. But then, then you go back, and then you have our community, which is in this particular situation, Czech or Slovak, and it's part of the European Union now. And we are still, I think, try to figure out who we are within that big community, because we do have identity. So to say, you know, you can't be nationalistic, it, to a certain extent, I think you should be. You know what I mean? Because that comes the, the writing that you can't, like other countries can understand, Germans can understand our sense of humor, we know that. They're not as funny as we are. <laughs> Everybody knows that. 
And we know this passion is Italian, sorry. And if, if that would not be true, every American here or everybody from LA can go to visit Bakersfield for vacation, but they go to Prague, they go to London, they go to France, they go to Paris, they go to Italy, you know, and they go for that identity, I think, for different food, for different culture, and and that's what's so inspiring, I think, to me. So so it's it's really hard for me to understand how to kind of function within the same community, preserving our cultures, preserving our um, our customs, and, and not try to be one, you know, big nation of Europeans. On one level, yes, when it comes to democracy, to freedom, and all this bigger level, but at the same time, to preserve our culture, identity, it's very different. And sometimes it seems to me, especially in my own family, when we fight over this, that there's this tendency to say, we want you to be what we are like. But I think there's something to be said, we like what we have, you know? So that's kind of where the line comes for me, um, trying to figure out. Anyway, I love Czech and you know, Slovaks, so cheers to everybody. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think we, I mean, we could can continue the conversation for much longer, but uh, one of the things that I think uh, Central Europeans have in common with Jesuits um, is that conversation is often best continued over uh, uh, drinks and some food. Um, and so I think I am going to uh, invite people directly to continue the conversation at the reception, um, but I do want to thank all of our guests, and I hope that um, you avail yourselves of them in during the reception and, and learn more about their stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very short very short I, I would like to just close this one, one important moment that from, from my memories that I want you to guys think on uh, this New Year's Eve, because it's going to be 30 years. So after all this, and I'm sure you probably were there too, even we didn't really necessarily know each other, uh, um, Wenceslav Square, uh, December 31st. Was anybody there? On, who was there? Were you there? <laughs> um, we were carrying this bottle of champagne. Do you remember this? We were all carrying everybody, a lot of us sitting in this room, and definitely these guys, and we didn't even know each other then. We were all carrying a bottle of champagne in this freezing, freezing cold, that by the time we were carrying, it was probably warm. And when there was this midnight, and everybody opened the champagne, there was this incredible rain, rain of champagne. Do you remember this? <laughs> and oh, there were always corks, and the champagne pouring on. It was like a rain everywhere. For that, Look at this image. That's how it looked like, except there was pouring champagne on everybody, and we were all wet, frozen, and celebrating the freedom. And then I think I would like you guys to think about it this, this New Year's Eve when it comes, whoever is Czech here in this room. <laughs>